morning everyone and welcome to our webinar on cryptocurrency which is hosted by mill park school of financial planning and insurance my name is somila Ntinge and i'm from the marketing team joining me today is gizla butler who is a lecturer within the school she will be taking you through our courses and basically what mill park is about and later on, she will be introducing you to our awesome speaker who will be speaking here today. Um, just a bit of housekeeping from my side. I see you guys have been using our interactive chat box, which is on the right hand side of the screen. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And we are very honored to have you here this morning. Just a few things to note. We are running polls. If you'd like us to be in touch with you regarding our courses, please um, click on the poll and um, tell us in which field would you like to be contacted on. And then also we have an ask a question box, which is at the bottom of the screen. Please pop in all your questions there. Um, we, will be we will be having a Q&A session later on where Don and Gizla will be answering all your questions. So without wasting more time, I'm going to hand over to Gizla to take us through um, Mopark and the courses that we have. Over to you, Gizla. Thank you, Samila. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick introduction to Mopark and who we are and why we're here today, really. So as Mopark Education, we partner with you to provide a world-class education, helping you upskill and prepare for the future digital world of work. Our schools uh, are the School of Professional Accounting, the School of Commerce, our School of Financial Planning and Insurance, the School of Investment and Banking, and then Mill Park Business School. Now, we will be soon launching um, our newly amalgamated school, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, but here is basically the kinds of schools that we have and what you can expect to be able to study with us. Now, in the School of Financial Services, which is what we'll be known as, the courses that we offer are formal qualifications from higher certificates and on our Mill Park Business School, the doctorate. We also offer regulatory exam support. That's on RE1 and RE5 for any representatives. We then have the class of business courses as per the FSCA requirements. And lastly, we offer bespoke training courses for any corporate clients. So why have we done this webinar in particular? Now, on the 19th of October 2022, the FSCA declared cryptocurrency as an official registered entity and uh, product under the FSCA regulations. So within our school, we did some investigation and we did an internal CPD course just kind of to touch base on what that meant and what it was that uh, we would potentially have to start looking into. And as we dug deeper, um, I thought I was just giving a really a basic overview, but I got into contact with John uh, through a mutual contact of ours. And as we were chatting, I just kind of realized, wow, there is so much that we need to actually get into and that we need to unpack. So while I'm not a fortune teller, I do anticipate that this could be a class of business topic and um, course that we could offer going on in the future. And I'd love to open up the dialogue with uh, both investors and advisors as to see what it is that crypto is about, how can we offer it as part of a diversified portfolio for our clients, and what it is that kind of um, could be happening in the future. And I'd also like to keep everybody up to date with what's happening within the industry. Uh, so if there are any other webinars that you'd like us to present, uh, please let me know and we'll have a look into it. But to circle back now, um, to introduce you to our speaker, I realized I didn't even introduce myself. <laughs> I'm Gisela Badler, and I am a lecturer in the School of Financial Services. I lecture in the Risk and Insurance Department, and um, I also have some compliance subjects. And I look after the RE1 and RE5 short courses that we do. So that's me, and our speaker today is John, Don Kruger. He is the Product Development Lead at the Purple Group. 
which is a leading fintech company in South Africa. Alongside Easy Equities and Easy Properties, Don led the development and successful deployment of the Easy Crypto Investment Platform. I'm sure you've all heard of Easy Equities and the Purple Group um, doing really great things. Prior to that, and why I got into contact with Don, is that he completed his master's degree in finance at the University of Pretoria. And he researched a diversification benefits of crypto assets in South Africa in terms of investment portfolios specifically. And as if that wasn't enough, he decided that he wanted to do his master's in IT, which he's currently busy with at the University of Cape Town. And he's appeared as a guest speaker at many crypto conferences. Uh, he talks at podcasts, and he was also telling us that um, he has facilitated some classes before uh, for education. So without further ado, um, I'm going to hand over to Don. You can find us uh, at any of these various places. We've got a very big online presence. Please look for me on LinkedIn. I'm Amanda Gisela Badler. If you'd like to keep up to date with any other changes that we have or just have any questions for me. And then lastly, in terms of our product offering and all of the courses that we offer, please let us know in the polls what we can help you with and how we can contact you. And if you have any other questions that you want to ask, please do so in the ask a question box. We will be endeavoring to get to all of your questions at the end of the session. I'm sure there will be many, but if we can't get to everything, we will provide you with some links on what else you can ask. So Don, I'm gonna hand over to you. Thank you very much for being here with us today and for sharing your knowledge. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks for the warm welcome. I'm going to quickly share my screen. And please stop me at any time if the content is not appearing. All right, so hopefully you can see my screen. Um, I'm just going to get started. So hi, everyone. My name is Don Kruger, and I will be giving a Crypto 101. I do think something that is needed in the space is education, so I'm always excited to present uh, these type of topics. So this is basically a webinar or a crypto asset survival kit, if you will, for financial professionals. I'm excited to be here with all of you and transfer some knowledge about the fundamental principles that you can use to navigate discussions and analyses about the sector a little bit more confidently. I will be taking questions at the end for any queries you may have, and you're welcome to pop your questions in the group chat on the right hand side of your screen. The content I'll be covering today extends to decentralization. And I really want to drive home why that matters. We're going to look at Bitcoin scarcity and the fiat inflation predicament. I'll be looking at a time series analysis of the US dollar purchasing power and give some context to that. I'm also going to discuss a very difficult question I often get, which is what is the intrinsic value of crypto? And I've seen a lot of people get stumped on that question. And I do get asked it a lot, so I can give you a very strong answer for that. It is very important to understand the difference between proof of work and proof of stake protocols when navigating discussions about the sector as well. So I'll give you, be giving an overview of how that works. I will also be addressing some cybersecurity misapprehensions and misconceptions and then discuss some of the findings from my master's research, which was specifically about the diversification benefits of crypto assets in domestic investment portfolios here in South Africa. Now, you may have heard the term, but what is a cryptocurrency? Um, I can describe it on three levels. The first level is if I had to describe it to a financial professional, or someone in tertiary education, I would say a cryptocurrency or crypto asset is a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer cryptographic protocol, which harnesses a distributed ledger to record and verify transactions. Strictly speaking, that is the definition. If I had to define it to a high school student, 
I would say it's a type of digital currency that uses complex mathematical algorithms to verify and secure transactions, uh, which are maintained by a network of users all across the globe. And then for the third level, if I had to define it to someone in primary school, I would say it is a type of money that can be used to buy pizza and toys anywhere on earth. So I've tried explaining crypto to little kids and I can tell you this is simply the best explanation uh, that they usually grasp. And I would like to start with something that is in the eyes of many, the fundamental appeal of blockchain technology, and that is decentralization. And what better place to start than with Bitcoin, the OG. So the Bitcoin paper was published in 2008 by the pseudonymous author or authors under the name of Satoshi Nakamoto. It may very well have been or likely have been a team of developers and he, she, or they have remained anonymous since its deployment. Uh, the Bitcoin blockchain has been running uninterrupted 24-7, 365, with zero downtime since its deployment. Now, what makes this technology so special is the current, and more importantly, the the potential for future economic risks and potentially even catastrophes that it avoids. It is fundamentally a hedge against centralized monetary and economic risk. And that's very important to understand. So before moving on, I'd like to preface this explanation with a quote that goes, decentralization does not matter until it suddenly does, by Naval Ravikant. So why have centralized systems failed time and time again? Well, it's fairly simple to understand. When we have a system, any system for that matter, which constitutes a collaboration of people or units of interaction, where a centralized component is responsible for the facilitation of all events in that system, it means that when the centralized node fails, the entire system is compromised and fails. This, of course, does not only apply to economic systems. It's shown, for example, that uh, company structures that embrace decentralization in their organizational hierarchies, where decision making power is delegated downwards, um, perform better and more efficiently than companies who deprive the lower levels of autonomy and make all of the decisions in the higher chains of command. On a macroeconomic scale, the integrity of the system is effectively dependent on three categories of centralized nodes. And I'm actually just speaking from my perspective in South Africa. Um, notably in South Africa, these would be national treasury in government, uh, the reserve bank and retail banks. If either of these nodes fail for whatever reason, then all participating nodes stemming from them are completely compromised. Where decentralization comes in is it alleviates the need for a central intermediary and empowers network participants to uphold the integrity of the network. Now, an important facet of decentralization is that a network is only as valuable as the belief and participation in the system. And some might think that is laughable. But the same is absolutely true for our current monetary fiat system. The cotton and linen based paper that we use today to buy things only works because we as humans collectively believe it works and we collectively participate in the centralized system. If one or more of the participants or validators in a blockchain, a decentralized system are compromised, well, the integrity of the system is kept intact by the other validators, 
the other nodes. The bigger the network and bigger the number of participating validators or nodes, and in the case of Bitcoin, it would be miners, um, the more robust and cryptographically secure that system is. Currently, the Bitcoin blockchain is the most deeply encrypted system on Earth by a long stretch. And as a result, the most cryptographically secure. And I will move on to cybersecurity misconceptions in a moment. The point is that effectively, we are looking at um, a fairly incorruptible economic system, not as susceptible to the pitfalls of human greed, incompetence, and lust for power. The beauty of a well-distributed network is you cannot wage physical war on the system because of how it's designed. You can only really wage war on its belief system. Now, that's important to understand. So let me put it this way. If you are someone who believes all governments across the globe are worthy of running long-run monetary systems sustainably, then the decentralization benefit of crypto assets may never actually make sense to you. But that's okay. Um, there are also other benefits to this technology as well. That's more than just a hedge against centralization risk. So one of the obvious benefits, of course, is the case for globalism. Um, as it currently stands with our current system of fiat, multiple forms of different fiat currency, exchange controls, uh, which are basically database value transfers if you're sending money from one country to another, um, can be a bit of a headache when you're using this system because it can take up to several days for the money to arrive for international transfers, if not more than a week. Holds are often placed on these transactions that require intervention. Uh, moreover, you just simply cannot send your rand or dollars anywhere that you please. So Bitcoin, on the other hand, is a globally liquid instrument that can be bought and sold across majority of nations on Earth with transfer speeds that range anywhere between 10 minutes and two hours. And this can be done even faster for Bitcoin scaling solutions like the BTC Lightning Network or through alternative cryptocurrencies such as Solana, Ethereum, Polygon uh, or Cardano, for example. Non-Bitcoin crypto assets are typically referred to as altcoins. It's a good term to remember. Now, recently, um, you may have seen it as well, but I saw an article from Charlie Munger, and this made the rounds in the media, um, who is an absolutely brilliant individual, a well-seasoned investor. He's one of Warren Buffett's compadres and colleagues. Anyway, he called for a ban on crypto. Now, I usually ignore FUD, FUD being an abbreviation for fear, uncertainty, and doubt. But when it comes to someone as brilliant as Charlie, um, I think it warrants a deeper inspection. I also loved his book, Poor Charlie's Almanac, and I don't think you should always ignore contrary um, arguments against crypto. So I looked into it, and the crux of his argument is really that Bitcoin undermines the US dollar. That is really what he has recognized, and rightfully so. It does. It detracts from centralized power. Whether that power be a force for good or evil, it detracts nevertheless. And this is a man who has spent a lifetime thinking about money and investing in a certain way. I can definitely see how the alternative model to money is not something that he fancies. Um, he is 99 years old, very invested in the legacy financial system and very wise and very patriotic indeed. Um, what I find fascinating though, is when you read between the lines of Charlie's other work, um, you also find his very real concerns that he has publicly expressed about the fiat system. And he wrote in 2021 um, about when you are printing money 
fiat money on the scale that modern nations are printing it, Japan, the United States, Europe, etc. We are getting into new territory in terms of size. So he acknowledges historically inflation has been, quote, the death of many great nations and democracies. Um, and I think his argument is a great segue onto the historical purchasing power of the United States dollar. So this graph shows exactly that. Now, in 1933, US President Roosevelt issued an executive order basically stating um, under the executive order of the president, you have to uh, provide or bring your gold to the Federal Reserve. You have to bring it to this centralized node of government. Now, it was a different time back then, but this is really what happened. Everyone was ordered to do this. Um, and this is the newspaper extract of that exact order. So at this time, oh, sorry, I'm not showing it on the screen. Here is the newspaper extract of that exact order from President Roosevelt. All right. Uh, so I found that very fascinating. I just thought I'd put that up there. But at this time, $1 could buy you 10 bottles of beer, whereas today that would cost you uh, about $20. Now, in 1944, as World War II was coming to an end following the United States intervention against Germany, the US dollar became the global reserve currency. At this time, you could buy 20 bottles of Coca-Cola with $1, which would cost you about $15 today. Uh, later, in 1971, following the Bretton Woods Conference, you may have heard of that as well, um, the gold standard was abandoned and money was no longer backed by gold. Um, $1 could buy you 17 oranges, equivalent to about $7 today. Um, that was a fundamental shift um, in a time where we had sort of been eased into thinking about money as paper and no longer backed by uh, value of scarcity, right? Um, but that is what happened. So later in 2008, following the housing crisis, um, quantitative easing was extensively used to combat the housing crisis leading to further inflation and value erosion of the dollar. And in 2020, uh, following the pandemic, the US government printed $3.8 trillion. And that is 20 something percent of all dollars ever created. So the issue that modern nations are currently facing is having to contend with a global reserve currency eroding in value over time due to a lack of scarcity and effectively infinite printing capabilities. Now, um, we must actually give credit to the United States for not completely abusing this power such as other nations have. Um, and something I do find very interesting about crypto is when we talk about the price, the market cap or the value of crypto, the ironic thing is how Bitcoin is a currency getting exponentially more valuable with time in the long run uh, due to its scarcity, which I'll explain shortly. Um, Bitcoin is measured against a currency growing exponentially weaker with time. That, does, that is not scarce. So it's very interesting. Now, I would argue that the US has a robust economic system for the most part. Um, the argument in favor, albeit strong against the US dollar, is particularly applicable to nations experiencing severe economic turmoil due to uh, monetary and fiscal mismanagement. And more often than not, just blatant corruption. So if we look at Argentina, Zimbabwe, Lebanon, Syria, Venezuela, Peru, Chile, Sudan, Turkey, Sri Lanka, Nigeria, of which are some recent examples of nations experiencing severe economic distress. Um, you know, you may have seen the news online, but the point is the culprit 
of which in every instance is arguably a consequence of economic centralization. And there are countless more examples if we look further back in history. Another modern example is, of course, Ukraine right now, uh, which has received funding in crypto given the logistical constraints of the war. Um, so we're actually seeing that be a more robust form of or a more robust medium of exchange when there's blatant war underway in a country. OK, so let's look at it this way. If we consider the inflation rates from last year, 2022 witnessed double digit inflation for more than 40 percent of countries across the globe. Uh, the recent CPI figures in the U.S. just came in above expectations. And uh, yeah, the point is our current fiat system does leave us in a bit of a value erosion predicament. Um, inflation is something that is difficult to ignore. You have to put your money to work. You can't just keep it under your bed. And this is where Bitcoin scarcity comes into play. The supply of Bitcoin is capped at 21 million units. 21 million units is a handy number to remember. It can never be more and never will be more than 21 million. With each halving event um, or halving cycle in Bitcoin mining, which happens approximately every four years, the block rewards are halved and we get incrementally 50% closer to the 21 million supply cap. Um, I don't think I should go into that now. Um, so basically, there are 19.3 million in circulation at the moment, and we have 1.7 left to mine. Uh, but, but mining can be a technical discussion, which I don't think is appropriate for this webinar. But with 21 million units, this begs the question, is that scalable? to a future human population of 11 billion people? Um, the answer is it is because one Bitcoin fortunately accommodates up to eight decimal places. The smallest unit of a Bitcoin is called a Satoshi or one sat for short. So on the screen, we see eight Satoshis or eight sats at the last decimal place. Um, 98 sats, 398 sats, and so forth. Effectively, 100 million Satoshis equals one Bitcoin. So I calculated it, and that means the total sats um, possible are 2 quadrillion, 100 trillion, 700 billion fatillion. And I confirmed that one with Jacob Zuma. A scenario of global adoption or widespread international propagated use, if you will, will see the average person not really coming near to even owning one Bitcoin. So I would expect the future wealth distribution to contain hierarchies, similar to what we see in the current fiat system, um, as well as the crypto system, by the way. So. The good news is the wealth distribution in crypto right now, especially in Bitcoin, um, is actually not as top heavy as the US dollar fiat system. But that may change for better or for worse. Hence, thinking about money in this way, quite literally, right, inverts the way we think about the current fiat model. And from the symbol of the dollar is born the symbol of satoshis an inverted dollar sign and i think this is absolutely brilliant not only because it is an inverted dollar sign which is appropriately symbolic but because if you look closely it also resembles a two and a one which is emblematic to the 21 million supply cap quite fitting but i must say um, I think we are a few decades out from thinking about money in this way as a society, if not more, or if not ever. Paradigm shifts in something so fundamental to society like this, I believe, can only be a generational transition. Um, so for the time being, 
most people look at crypto as an investment asset and are more focused on other use cases offering utility right now um, and are more worried about the price denominated in dollars. So how does one answer the difficult question of what is the intrinsic value of crypto? The best model that I've seen is Medkov's law which directly extends to the underlying concept of utility that the network offers. Remember, a network is only as valuable as the people using the network, as I described earlier. There is no dividend discount model or free cash flow to equity that we can use. In terms of valuation, we have to think of it as a commodity, such as platinum, diamonds, or gold that offers high-speed global payment utility and solves the middleman problem of money. So uh, Metcalf's law is a bit of an equation and it states that the value of a network is proportional to the square of the number of connected users to that system. So if you multiply that out, it's n squared, right? But even so, deriving a dollar value to determine whether or not it is under or overvalued would still require some subjective intervention. So it is hence best to avoid sweeping statements about its intrinsic value. And remember, um, an outcome for the future that ought to be is not necessarily a future that will be. Painting a rosy picture about crypto globalism is fundamentally conjecture and should be conveyed responsibly. Um, now, there are other forms of utility in crypto, especially in the altcoin space. Payments and remittances, uh, DeFi, or decentralized finance for short, has opened a gateway to global lending, borrowing, and trading. NFTs, though still finding their feet, are evolving beyond just digital asset ownership of JPEG images, um, but also digital asset ownership of real estate, the ownership of code extending into the metaverse, which also opens an avenue to anything digital like gaming, internet of things, and social media. The thing about crypto is it is 100% more symbiotic with technology than we give it credit for. Um, now, proof of work versus proof of stake. I think it's important to understand the difference between proof of work protocols such as Bitcoin and proof of stake protocols adopted by many altcoins when navigating discussions about the sector. Um, in a nutshell, proof of work is basically something, it's a consensus mechanism that requires miners to solve complex encryption puzzles in order to validate transactions and create new blocks on the blockchain. The miners, in the case of Bitcoin, are rewarded for doing this. Um, this process can be resource intensive and requires a lot of computational power, which means it can be expensive to maintain and lead to high energy consumption, right? Um, however, there are also evolving use cases where the heat generated from mining can be repurposed. There are geothermal mining projects already deployed, and there are also large scale projects underway to propel green energy mining efforts for proof of work protocols. Proof of stake, on the other hand, doesn't require miners to solve complex algorithms. So instead, validators are chosen, so nodes um, are chosen based on the amount of cryptocurrency they hold. Validators are basically selected at random to validate these transactions and create new blocks on that specific blockchain, like Ethereum, for example. Um, validators are luckily incentivized to act honestly because um, their stake in the network is at risk if they act maliciously. So in simple terms, the key difference is proof of work requires miners to solve complex mathematical problems, while proof of stake selects validators based on the amount of crypto they hold, right? Now, proof of stake is generally considered to be more energy efficient 
and cost effective than proof of work. But it also has some potential drawbacks, such as the potential um, for centralization. If a small number of validators hold a large proportion of that cryptocurrency, um, that can be centralized. So proof of stake works well for Ethereum because it has a healthy wallet distribution and participation rate on the blockchain. But uh, for newer proof of stake protocols, um, if you look at some of the more recent ICOs, ICO being initial coin offering, uh, those are not as well distributed. So I want to basically drive home the point that the participation and distribution is really what matters. A network is only as valuable as its constituents, right? Um, so that's why I pay very little attention to the price of crypto. I am way more concerned about the blockchain figures, namely the number of active wallets on the blockchain. So as long as the long run trend is intact, I would say things are on track for gradual propagation and potential widespread adoption. And there is a virtuous cycle at play. Um, more participants in the network leads to higher demand, which pushes up the USD denominated price. Um, a higher price incentivizes more miners to join the network. This leads to even further security through deeper encryption and makes it fundamentally more attractive as a global medium of exchange or store of value. All right, so I think I've got about five minutes left. Um, let me briefly discuss or address cybersecurity misconceptions. Now, you may have heard of cryptocurrency breaches or hacks. Um, now, these instances of hacking typically occur through intermediaries, onboarding pe people into the crypto asset sector, or it can happen with people handling crypto on behalf of others, i.e. FTX and countless other examples. Um, the important thing to, to note is the crypto itself, the cryptography itself underlying these protocols has never been hacked. And I speak, of course, for the larger reputable coins with uh, larger coins by market cap uh, who have very healthy distributions on their blockchain. Um, Effectively, the point of failure happens around the blockchain, but not inside the blockchain, if you know what you're doing. So the integrity of encryption is 100% intact. Malicious actors, however, take advantage of the lack of knowledge in the space and steal funds at these points of failure. And that is also why regulation is a good thing. Regulation does not regulate the blockchain. You can never regulate the blockchain. The blockchain is bigger than you. It's bigger than any country. But you can regulate the centralized nodes operating around the blockchain and make it safer for people to onboard into crypto so that things like FTX and Genesis do not happen. So also, it is very important that you do thorough due diligence of crypto asset service providers. Um, it is of the utmost importance, actually, when onboarding yourself all clients into the space. Um, now, I would like to end my segment with the diversification benefits of crypto assets in South African investment portfolios. And this assumes a 2.5% allocation to various ASISA portfolios. So ASISA is the Association of Savings and Investment in South Africa. And this is where the notion of risk is so important to understand. Um, so I want to start by being blunt about the sharp ratio, okay? And how we address notions of risk in finance. And this is a good segue into portfolio diversification. Um, the sharp ratio provides a figure showing the excess return per unit of risk, whereby the standard deviation of price or price volatility has widely been accepted as a unit of risk in finance. Um, and the point I want to make is that we should not look at crypto price volatility against the US dollar or RAND 
as a metric of risk necessarily. But if we do, we have to consider that price volatility goes both ways. The denominator of that equation goes both ways. And it would be more accurate to quantify the downside price movement as an unfavorable risk event. Upwards price movements um, have never bothered anyone really unless they are short the position um, and are generally good for the health of a portfolio. An enhanced version of this ratio, the sharp ratio, um, that takes into account only the red arrows, the downwards movements, is the Sortino ratio. So that's the column on the far right. Um, in other words, we need to look at downside risk as a true metric of risk. And the Sortino ratio does just that. It's an improvement or a modification of that sharp ratio formula that I showed you. So in other words, um, if we look at three of the following South African crypto index tracking instruments or crypto ETFs, if you will, um, we find the Sortino ratios have excess returns per unit of true risk that are actually superior or higher than the sharp ratios. The EC10 is an instrument which tracks the top 10 crypto assets passively um, by market cap. It's market cap weighted. The ECE10 is similar, but equally weighted. And the ECA20 is an altcoin index of the top 20 crypto assets. Um, their price characteristics can be quite insightful for looking at the sector segments in crypto holistically. Um, so basically what I specialized in for my master's dissertation were these diversification benefits. Um, and I showed using modern portfolio theory that a 2.5% allocation can enhance the risk adjusted returns of various ASISA classified port portfolios. So here you can see the various theoretically constructed portfolio categories I used for the investigation, equity portfolios, multi-asset portfolios, real estate, um, interest bearing portfolios. And I used a platter of exchange traded funds that you see here, um, investable on the JSE. And I use these to represent the various sectors in the retrospective construction of these portfolios. And to spice things up, I also constructed portfolios abiding to Regulation 28 of the Pension Funds Act in South Africa. So at the time when I did this, it was ambiguous whether or not crypto assets were permitted into pension fund portfolios. Um, I did actually send my research to the regulators after I was done, um, but I don't think they read it because shortly after Regulation 28, uh, posted that they now explicitly prohibit any investment into crypto assets. Um, but I am optimistic that this may change in the next five years since the international crypto policy um, has been growing increasingly accommodative. So we may follow suit as we do with most things uh, regulation wise. Um, yeah, so without going too deep down the rabbit hole, I showed there was a somewhat negligible level of correlation between crypto assets and these ETF funds listed on the JSE. Uh, for this analysis, I compared the ETFs to Bitcoin, Ethereum, Binance Coin, and XRP. And I compared it in such a way that the crypto inclusive portfolios, for the most part, exhibited enhanced risk adjusted returns following the inclusion. So on these graphs, the Y axis showing the portfolio mean return, um, the X axis, the X axis showing the portfolio standard deviation. Um, and this is what is called an efficient frontier. It was initially created by a gentleman called Harry Markovitz, I believe. Um, basically where the point on the curves that are situated closest to the top left, uh, those are points that demonstrate superior portfolio performance when you consider these underlying characteristics. Um, but do note that my research was a little bit biased um, in the time frame of the data that was available at that time. And much of this really showed the behavior during a period of increasing prices. So I do hope 
that uh, future scholars can study these behaviors across a longer time frame or in periods of price decline to see what really happens. So point being, crypto inclusion into a well-diversified portfolio may enhance the risk-adjusted returns. Uh, for someone with a lower tolerance for risk but an appetite for crypto, an index tracking instrument may be their cup of tea. Um, though there is a high level of correlation between the sector itself, we do see that these index tracking instruments exhibit somewhat lower volatility and are also subject to survivor survivorship bias, of course. Um, since it's passive, the crypto assets with the highest market cap, they remain in the instrument, and those that fall out of favor by the market are replaced by others that are. Uh, but yeah, that's it for me. My time is up. Thank you so much for listening. I hope I conveyed something useful to you. And yeah, much appreciation. If you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. So if we do have a couple of questions. Um, first up, I'm going to go um, through the questions that have been posted on the um, in the specific space. So if anybody else has any other questions, please pop them there. I am going to try to go through the chats, but um, I'm scared I missed something. So the first question that we have is from Samantha. And she wants to know, do you think that banks will be able to trace fraudulent activities through the blockchain? All right. So in crypto, there is a tool for CDD, continuous due diligence, called Chainalysis. And Chainalysis is typically used to look at the public ledger, which is viewable by anyone, and trace whether or not a transaction did go to a black listed address. So there are databases that show whether certain wallets are typically used for the dark web, for facilitating uh, human trafficking, drug trade, terrorist financing. There are wallets known to be associated with these activities, and that's where something like chain analysis gets involved. It's not foolproof, but typically mm -hmm. that is where banks would look to do their CDD. And is it monitored by somebody who can maybe start to like flag what these specific wallets are? Um, how, how, do you, how, would you, how would you get onto this list? Uh, uh, I don't really know how you would get onto this list. I wouldn't encourage anyone to try to get blacklisted there. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'd assume yeah. there would be, you know, I would think so. You know, there must be because it's so ongoing and investigation is so ongoing. Um, I would assume that there would be, but it's good that, um, that banks are at least able to, that there are measures in place. One of the other questions that we have here is from Francois, um, and he asked, what is the underlying value of BTC, of Bitcoin? But I think we answered that one. Uh, right now in US dollars, the price of Bitcoin is $24,826. Um, that is the, the USD denominated price right now. So it's actually one of the best performing crypto as best performing assets of 2023 um, that is because it just started off the year after a period of plummeting prices so we're seeing crypto assets up over 35 percent for the year um, just because it started off the year at such a low, low point following those plummeting prices okay cool then we have another question from david and um he says he would like to understand the concept of mining um he wants us to explain it and why does it take up so much energy? Okay. So mining is a little bit of a tricky one. Um, I can attempt to explain it. Um, it can be quite technical, especially for this audience. Um, but I did briefly allude to how mining works, right? So the mining participants are the nodes in the Bitcoin blockchain. But for altcoin blockchains, mining isn't necessarily applicable. So proof of stake protocols do not have mining. And in a nutshell, I, I wrote an article about this. It's actually on our Easy Crypto website, um, albeit a little while back. Um, the, 
the participants in the blockchain are the mining nodes. They are the validators and they get rewarded for recording and verifying transactions on the blockchain, right? And they do this um, intermittently throughout time as the halving uh, rewards events are approached. And eventually, um, it's sort of, um, I forgot, it's not an asymptote, but there's a, a word for it. If you stand on one side of the room and you always move 50% closer to the other side of the room, will you ever reach the end of the room? Um, so at some point, we keep halving the rewards that the miners receive every four years with each mm -hmm. halving cycle. And they are currently incentivized to mine with these block rewards which are halved every four years. Um, they use these uh, CPU, GPU processes. It varies. Um, there are companies like Bitmain that specifically makes computers dedicated to mining and people typically buy these. Some people have solo setups. I've heard it's a dodgy process to buy those dedicated mining instruments, uh, but you need very strong computers now because the block sizes are pretty complex and those puzzles that you have to solve are very complex at the moment. Um, now, once we reach the 21 million cap, the system is then only going to be incentivized by the transaction fees and no longer by the mining rewards. And there comes also a point or a price where the price of electricity is more expensive than what you get from mining. And right now, the last time I checked that price, if you're not using renewable energy, is around $13,000, I think. So that's going to be an interesting situation. If you ever see Bitcoin falling below $13,000, a lot of people, based on average electricity prices in the US, it might be cheaper in other parts of the world, uh, but they will no longer be financially incentivized to mine at those prices. So that's where we're going to see a transition into green energy for mining because that's more sustainable and more lucrative in the long run. Um, mining itself is a very complex thing. I recommend asking ChatGPT. It will explain to you how uh, nonces work, um, exactly how the SHA-256 algorithm works. There's a lot behind the cryptography itself that I think is worthy of a webinar in and of itself. Totally. Yeah, it sounds like it. I know that at one stage people were sort of trying to make a career or a living out of it. Um, okay, then the next point, question from Tashlin is, please explain staking coins. Okay, so I did explain staking coins. Um, I also mentioned it in one of the articles on easy crypto uh, but staking is effectively where the participants the holders are validating the transactions so a proof of stake protocol unlike mining is where the miners previously recorded and verified transactions on the blockchain now delegated nodes which are said to be staked based on their balances in that protocol are now sitting there, not being used for a uh, medium of exchange transactions, but they're just sitting there and they are validating based on their stake in the blockchain. Um, so those are picked at random. Again, it's a consensus mechanism and it's a, an alternative which does have its drawbacks. Um, yeah, proof of stake, it's just validators um, validating based on the crypto they hold in a nutshell. I think that's the highest level explanation I can give. And Tashin, again, this recording will be available afterwards. So um, if there's anything, you know, maybe that you just want to double check again about what Don said, you're welcome to have a look. And then we have the last question here. Firstly, I want to read the comment um, that was made by Joe, and then I want to answer, ask the question. So he says that you've convinced him. Uh, he wants to invest in your Easy Crypto EC10 crypto bundle fund. He says he believes that BRICS Plus and all the other countries that are de-dollarizing believes in them. And I believe crypto will be a great hedge against the fall of the overly counterfeited US dollar. 
And then in addition to that, he has said, um, how do we get hold of Purple Group to buy into crypto? Um, and then I know uh, from my own use that you guys do have various methods of how people can sort of um, use a safe space to have a look at, at, at crypto. Tell me a little bit about what it is that you guys do at Purple Group and through Easy Equities. Sure thing. All right, that was a pretty cool answer. I've shared a link to Easy Crypto. Um, if you do invest via Easy Equities, uh, you can just find Easy Crypto as one of the product components in Easy Equities. I think that's the easiest way to go about it. So it's a fractional investment model for equities, for properties, and now as well for crypto. So you can invest at as little as five Rand and your fees are always um, relative, like a very, very tiny percentage. So yeah, you can look at the URL I also sent now. Um, if you want to know more about those index tracking instruments, we also actually just launched a new one called the ECNMG bundle, um, NFTs, Metaverse, and GameFi. So it tracks that uh, component of the crypto sector. And it's, I think, a, a nice way to holistically own the sector. Um, but check out Easy Equities, check out Easy Crypto, check out the bundles, and DYOD, do your own research. Yeah, I think, I think that that's... Ooh, I think Gazella just dropped off. Yeah. So that is my input. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate the attendance and all the participation in the group chat. Uh, Samilla, do you want to jump in here and maybe end off our session? Hi, I'm so sorry. Uh, I don't know what happened there. It is um typical of the times we live in sometimes things drop uh no i just wanted to say thank you so much to you thank you for everybody's attendance um i will be sending or popping a link to where this will be recorded so we have a youtube channel please follow it um all park education uh you can follow us on linkedin and you're welcome to have a look uh, on my page or i we'll post it in a couple of places so there is definitely a recording have a look and if you have any other questions you are welcome to send more park an email um we'd love to get in touch with anybody that's interested in going through any of our courses um our class of business or um, our formal qualifications and other than that yeah thanks so much for your time john thank you again um it's great we've never met in person and this is the power the great power of technology is to be able to contact someone get in touch <laughs> and make sort of meaningful connections. So thank you very, very much. And um, thank you everybody for attending and we'll see you again. Thank you so much. Cheers everyone. Bye. Bye.